tonight on Connecticut's news station, the election battle in Bridgeport continues with calls tonight for the primary election to be overturned. And new questions arise over the security of absentee ballots with a call for state officials to do something about it. Plus, carjacking crackdown. Two arrests made after the crime is caught on camera. And a Connecticut native is back on American soil after being released in a deal with Iran. We'll get an update from his hometown. It's chaos. <laughs> it was harsh. It was not fun at all. And a sigh of relief for now. Trapped residents finally free after heavy rains wash away their home. But the solution, only temporary. Now at 6, this is Fox 61, Connecticut's news station. And good evening and thanks for joining us for the Fox 61 News at 6. I'm Brent Harden. And I'm Sarah Sanchez. Today, the John Gomes for Mayor of Bridgeport campaign files a lawsuit asking a judge to overturn the results of the primary election and order a new election be held. And this comes on the heels of surveillance video showing possible election fraud, and it's putting a state spotlight on the security of absentee ballots. Fox 61's Matt Karen is live from the state capitol with our story. Matt. Republican leaders here at the state capitol are calling on Democratic leaders to tackle this issue of election security and not next year, but next week when a special session is slated to be held. I don't think this can wait. This video surfacing in Bridgeport, allegedly showing city employee and Mayor Joe Gannam supporter Wanda Jeter Pataki stuffing white envelopes into an absentee ballot drop box. We have for years said that those need to be inside the municipal, municipal buildings, not outside the municipal buildings. And until we can get this so that it's secure, I think we've got to stop that process. Democratic leaders agree it's concerning. It causes concern if people don't have faith in the integrity of the system. The public is correctly concerned. But does the law need to change? If we have to tighten up any of the regulations to give people confidence, we will. But I just can't jump to conclusions. The law currently allows campaign operatives to solicit absentee ballot applications although the actual ballots must be mailed to the individual. A completed ballot can only be returned to a drop box by the voter, a designated caretaker of a voter with an illness or disability, or if it's a student, a member of their immediate family. This situation is not about partisan politics. It's not about a broken electoral system. This isn't even about absentee ballot systems. It's about a few bad actors and an undereducated electorate. This is an electoral issue. This is something that needs to be addressed. To blame uh, the good people of Bridgeport, I find that comment offensive. The Gomes campaign lawsuit accuses the Ganim campaign of the illegal depositing of absentee ballots, distribution of ballot applications, and completion of ballots, saying the result of the election is seriously in doubt. The Secretary of the State telling Fox 61 expanding absentee voting even further may actually be more secure. If an absentee ballot application is sent to everyone, the lists are cleaner and it puts more power in the hands of individual voters. And Connecticut voters will actually be the ones to decide in 2024 whether to change the state constitution to allow for what's known as no excuse absentee voting. And state legislators, meanwhile, here, they say they'll continue to strive for bipartisan compromise on an early voting provision. As for that special session slated for next week, all sources here tell me that there is little to no chance that election security is a topic that makes it on the agenda. We're live here at the State Capitol Complex in Hartford. Matt Karen, Fox 61, Connecticut's news station. All right, thank you, Matt. Uh, we have an update tonight. Police have made two arrests in connection to a carjacking and assault at a home in Westport. We first showed you this video yesterday of an Aston Martin being stolen from a private garage. The police have now arrested a 16-year-old after a search at a home in Waterbury connected him to the carjacking. That teen is also facing separate charges in the theft of a BMW that was actually used during that carjacking. Now, police they found the, say they found the Aston Martin along with the BMW and two other stolen cars
during a search at a home in Berlin yesterday, and 39-year-old Derek McGill, who lives at that home, was arrested. He faces charges of running a chop shop. McGill is not facing charges out of Westport. Four people are recovering tonight after a crash in Newington. Police say two cars crashed at the intersection of Cedar Street and Willard Avenue just before 7 this morning. Four people were taken to the hospital, but the extent of their injuries are unclear. The cause of the crash remains under investigation. New details on a tractor trailer crash on I-91 North in Rocky Hill. State police arrested a driver involved in that crash. They say 37-year-old Fernandita Aquino Almonte from South Windsor switched lanes and drove in front of the tractor trailer Sunday morning before slowing down. They say the truck couldn't stop in time and hit the car. No one was hurt, but the highway was closed for hours. Enfield police are looking to identify this man who they say was exposing himself at the Enfield Square Mall. Police say they received several reports yesterday that the man was exposing himself to women and attempting to coax them into performing sexual acts. When police arrived, he was gone. Anyone with information should call Enfield police. Well, five American hostages are officially back on U.S. soil tonight. They were held in Iran and released as part of a deal between Tehran and D.C. And one of those Americans returning home today, a local man from Weston, Connecticut. That's where we find Fox 61 political reporter Emma Wolforst. State officials and advocates call Morad Tabaz's release a long time coming. But while they celebrate this hard fought win, some concerned about the possible implications of this deal with Iran. <laughs> Tearful reunions and sighs of relief Tuesday morning as the plane carrying five former Iranian hostages landed in the U.S. And thank God now after five and a half years of brutality, Murad is a free man. One of those released Connecticut resident, Murad Tabaz. Tabaz is a wildlife conservationist and was detained after traveling to Iran in January 2018. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison on charges of spying and collusion against Iran's national security. I want just people to understand what these people went through. You spend days and months blindfolded. This is the pain everybody is facing and nobody is talking about. Zakah was imprisoned in Iran at the same time as Tabaz and one of the other hostages released Tuesday. He says it's important the U.S. negotiate to get these Americans home, but has concerns about this most recent deal. It should be a transparent process. It, ha it should be. I believe that the, the process has a lot of unknown unknown deals behind the scene, in my opinion. In exchange for the five American hostages, five Iranians were also released from U.S. custody, and $6 billion in Iranian oil funds were unfrozen and transferred to accounts in Qatar for humanitarian use. Congressman Himes tells me, despite criticism, this deal was necessary. These deals are always hard. The five Iranians, they were sanctioned violators. They weren't murderers. They weren't Iranian intelligence agents. The money is going to a bank in Qatar that we have a lot of transparency and insight into. So we'll be able to see if the Iranians are abusing the deal. And Tabaz not back home here in Weston just yet. Representative Himes tells me he's currently receiving a medical checkup and will also be debriefed, hoping Tabaz will be back here in Connecticut within the next week. Reporting in Weston, Emma Wolforst, Fox 61, Connecticut's news station. Emma, thank you. Hamden police are investigating a shooting that left one person in critical condition. Police say a 34-year-old was shot in the face in the area of Goodrich and Butler Street last night. That victim was taken to a hospital. There's no word on any suspect or suspects uh, or arrests at this point. Bristol police are investigating two hate crime incidents. Police say a racial slur was written in chalk along a sidewalk in Rockwell Park over the weekend. And yesterday, police say they found swastikas painted on a sign at the entrance of Northeast Middle School and a nearby stop sign. Police are asking anyone living in the area to check their surveillance cameras for any video. Anyone with information should call Bristol Police. More mosquitoes are testing positive for West Nile virus in the state, the latest in Meriden at Falcon Park. In Ledyard, mosquitoes have also tested positive for West Nile, and those mosquitoes in Ledyard also tested positive for Triple E virus. So far, there have been two confirmed cases of people contracting the virus this year in Connecticut. That's West Nile, that is. No human cases of Triple E have been reported here this summer. 
Turning to the weather now, a beautiful day across the state. Yeah, yes. Chief Meteorologist Rachel Frank joining us. Rachel, it's, a, it's the beginning of a beautiful stretch. I mean, I don't know what I'm going to do with myself the next <laughs> Easy <few> week, Rachel. <laughs> it's nice and calm in the weather center. We're going to see even more sunshine in the days ahead. The humidity will stay nice and low. We're looking at refreshing mornings, nice comfy afternoons. And while today was a bit breezy, I think the wind will depart later tonight, and it's not an issue at all in the coming days. Near 70 degrees right now in Hartford. Yeah, we have a few clouds that are moving through right now. I don't think that that'll be as much of an issue tomorrow. We are seeing some occasional gusts up around 20 miles an hour in Groton, close to 15 for the Hartford area. And temperatures currently are in the mid 60s to right around 70 degrees across the state. There's not much to show you here on the radar, but again, we do have a few passing clouds working through. It'll get cooler tonight. Again, refreshing as we head towards daybreak with overnight lows near 50 degrees, and we could see some upper 40s for some of our cooler spots and outlying areas. Tomorrow looking great, sunshine, less of a breeze, high temperatures climbing into the low to mid 70s. I hope this looks nice to you because we're going to do this again on Thursday. On Friday, we'll see more clouds, but we do have questions about the weekend. There is a chance for some rain. Is it a super soaker or just a few showers? We'll take a closer look. Your full forecast coming up. Rachel, thank you. New tonight, the city of New Haven giving an update on its budget and financial outlook moving forward. The city reporting a surplus of more than $22 million for the fiscal year that ended at the end of June. And with that surplus, the city will pay $15 million for the Randy Cox settlement. That's in addition to the $30 million that insurance will pay in that settlement. Developing tonight, Norwich authorities are investigating a fire and a death. A man was found dead in a fire on Central Avenue this morning. That man has not been identified, but Fox 61's Angela Bavaro shares what we know so far. A Norwich neighborhood turned tragedy scene, complete with fire trucks and flashing lights. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry for their loss. I mean, I cut his hair a few times, you know. It's just hard. Harrison Faison owns the barbershop next to the building on Central Avenue where a man was found dead in a fire. At the same time, I was pulling up the brother of the individual that was in there that pulled up the same time. So when I pulled up to the curb, I jumped out. I said, your brother is stuck up there. You see him. So a lot of people screaming, running. You see the smoke coming out. I can hear him screaming. Crews responded to the mixed use building just before 8 o'clock Tuesday morning which houses an apartment and business on the first floor and an apartment on the second floor. Immediately started to stretch a hand line to the seat of the fire, which was located on the second floor of the building. Crews also preparing to make a rescue with the report of a person trapped inside. They were able to start to knock down the fire, and during that time they located a male, adult male, on the second floor that has fortunately passed away. Three people are now displaced as a result of the fire and the community is grieving. It's close to home. I mean, how else would I, would I feel, you know? This guy was one of my customers. The fire department says the second floor is unlivable. The Red Cross is helping the people who have been displaced. The cause of this fire still under investigation. Reporting in Norwich, I'm Angelo Bavar, Fox 61, Connecticut's news station.